Why does Jesus matter today? Open your Bible and turn to Matthew chapter 26, starting in verse 57. Elders and deacons, why does Jesus matter today on a day when you've taken solemn commitments or have been reminded of the commitments that you previously made? Christians, why does Jesus matter when you have made a commitment to follow Jesus? I think of Cobra Kai. So nothing makes you want to take a karate class like Cobra Kai. So like within maybe two episodes, these kids that are getting bullied like crazy are just like top shelf ninjas and like nobody can stop them. It's amazing how in about 90 minutes of of, of binging, you, you, you feel like you're along for the ride. And I remember going with Isaac because in the midst of this feeling, we had to start a karate class. So we start taking Taekwondo. Uh, And uh, so we go and we have our white belts to start and we're learning punches, very simple punches, a couple kicks, some very simple blocks. And we repeat those very simple things hundreds of times. And we find out that we're going to have to repeat those same very things millions of times for at least three years in order to start advanced training because that's what a black belt is. It's not the end. That's the beginning of the advanced training. And so we quit at the yellow belt (laughs) because (laughs) in a lot of ways, I'm, I'm a lot like our culture, low commitment culture. I mean, honestly, I'll do the 90-minute track to be the best ninja in the world, but the three-year track, I, I don't have time to commit to that right now. But in more serious ways, we struggle with commitment. It's, it's not just the, you know, the free subscription and cancel before the first billing kind of low commitment. It's not just a month-to-month lease kind of low commitment that we deal with. I mean, we, we deal in our culture with low commitment to marriage. We deal with low commitment to career. We do with, deal with low commitment to education. We deal with low commitment to our public vows of service, to our church vows of service. Low commitment. Looking for the out. Looking for that contractual loophole clause. That's our culture. That's in many of our hearts. Low commitment. We struggle with commitment. And in this passage, we're going to see, starting in verse 57, we see Jesus' commitment tested. And then we see his disciple, Peter, a leader among the disciples. We see his commitment tested. Starting in verse 57, then those who had seized Jesus led him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders had gathered. And Peter was following him at a distance, as far as the courtyard of the high priest. And going inside, he sat with the guards to see the end. Jesus has been betrayed, remember? Jesus was turned over to the elders and to the high priests of the people who wanted to kill him, we learned at the beginning of this passage, and we've known it for a long time before. They had worked through Judas, one of his disciples, to betray him, to locate him on this night. And so they can find him in secret and not cause a big uproar among the crowds of Jerusalem who love Jesus, who think he's amazing because he's taught them and he's healed them and he's blessed them. So quietly they do this and they they come and they take him. And he's silently going through all this. And meanwhile, Peter, we know that The rest of the disciples had fled in verse 56, but he didn't make it that far. Remember, Peter loved Jesus, and he was loved by Jesus. He knew what an incredible person Jesus was. He had seen what it was like when Jesus healed others. He had experienced Jesus' forgiveness to him. Remember, Peter had opposed Jesus' mission to go to the cross, and Jesus had harsh words for Peter. But then day after day, Jesus stuck with Peter. 
Peter has known his grace. He's been loved by Jesus. He couldn't imagine ever abandoning Jesus. He couldn't possibly imagine that. But tonight, that's all going to be tested. And, and it's on that night, in this passage of Scripture, that we see why Jesus really matters. Why does he matter to you who have made solemn commitments before the Lord? Whether they're public commitments or whether they're just private in the secret place of your heart, Jesus matters because he will keep his commitment to you. He always does, always has. He will never leave or forsake you. His word is sure. So we're gonna pray and then we're, we're gonna dig into why that really matters for us. Father, thank you for Jesus. We wanna see him today. We want to love him and be loved by him. We want to follow him. So Lord, lift him up in the eyes of our heart. Holy Spirit, minister by this word and meet us where we need to be met. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We're gonna see Jesus keeping his commitment. We're gonna see the costly commitment of Jesus and then the caving commitment of Peter in this passage. Look with me at verse 59, the costly commitment of Jesus. The chief priests and the whole council were seeking false testimony against Jesus that they might put him to death. Now think of the context. This is the middle of the night. The whole council has showed up in the middle of the night for this moment of Jesus's arrest at the high priest's home. And they're seeking these worthless men to find anything that will stick against Jesus. Have you ever seen a moment like this where people are just throwing out accusations, but they don't add up? And there's actually a law in, among the Jews that no one should be put to death apart from two witnesses, Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse six. And so although they really wanna kill Jesus, and they're looking for whatever they can find that will let them do it. They're not gonna do it unless they can justify it. But finally, they find their justification. Two come forward at last, verse 60. And they said, this man said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to rebuild it in three days. Two witnesses. And they're actually saying something that's true. Jesus did say this, right? We heard him echo these words back in chapter 24, verse one, when he's talking to his disciples as he's leaving the temple. Yes, Jesus said these, but of course these words are being taken out of context. Have you ever been taken out of context? Misunderstood, your words misused. His words are taken out of context and certainly not even sought to be understood in the best light, right? <laughs> because they wanna kill him. And so these words are speaking against the heart of their national identity. Remember, these are people who are much like many of us today who have a strong sense of identity from our nation, from where we live. Even to the point of what we might call nationalism, where they would actually elevate their nation above every other nation. We're more important than all the other peoples of the world. And to give them some bit of a pass, remember, they have been the people of God who've been given the promises of God, but God had always had in mind the blessing of all the nations and welcoming all the peoples of the earth to himself. And at times they would miss that. The temple was a symbol of their national identity. We are the people of God. We are the blessed ones. And for someone to speak against the temple in that way would, would strike them as, as unpatriotic to the nth degree against us, against who we are. It's like a, a betrayal. And furthermore, this would be on, board, on, on the par of blasphemy to speak something damnably false about God because Jesus is saying he has the power to do this in three days. What, what human has the ability to knock down the temple and rebuild it in three days? Not, not a single one. Even in 21st century technology, we couldn't possibly get it done. This is a massive complex. This is ornate architecture and metalwork and craft. Not a chance. Of course, Jesus, we know, was speaking about his own body because the temple he would build was his own resurrection body to which all people would be welcomed.
to come to him in faith and be united to him forever. But of course, they're not gonna slow down to ask those questions. He's given them what they need. And so the high priest stands up and says, have you no answer to make? He's speaking to Jesus now. What is it that these men testify against you? And look at Jesus, verse 63. How is, how is he in this moment? And, and imagine how you would be in a moment when all of these false witnesses are saying all these ridiculous things about you. And then these few people come and utter something you said, but with no context given. How are you? Well, Jesus remained silent. He doesn't correct misunderstanding. He doesn't defend himself. Why? Because this was his calling. He was sent for this purpose. He was sent to be betrayed. He was sent to be reviled and mocked. He was sent to be wrongly judged to death and crucified. And he was going. He was committed. So he was silent. And the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Perhaps, I wonder, was he asking this because he needed just a little bit more so that the Romans could actually put Jesus to death? Because remember, the Jewish council did not have the authority to minister the capital punishment. And if Jesus calls himself a king, the Christ, well, now that is something that the Romans would not like. But he does say in response, verse 64, Jesus says, you have said so. <laughs> you said it, not me. But then he goes on. But I tell you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Jesus goes to his favorite passage to talk about himself. He's the son of man. He is the one to whom all nations would come and he would approach the ancient of days as Daniel saw in chapter seven, verses 13 and 14 of his prophecy. And God would give him a kingdom without end and dominion over all the peoples of the earth, all authority in heaven and on earth. That's me, Jesus is saying. I'm the one who will come on the clouds of heaven and I'm here. And not only this, but I'm the fulfillment of Psalm 110 where David saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Jesus is in a special relationship with God above all of the rest. He's the son of man, the son of God. And upon these words, this bold self-declaration that Jesus gives Truly, knowing they won't hear him, knowing they'll misuse the words, knowing that it will lead to his death. He says this, and then the high priest tore his robes and says he has uttered blasphemy. What further witnesses do we need? You've now heard his blasphemy. He's speaking to the council that's gathered in the middle of the night there in his courtyard. What is your judgment? And they answer, he deserves death. Remember, that was the predetermined outcome before it all began. And we might imagine, if we want to give them the benefit of the doubt, historically, which I think is, it's very doubtful, we could imagine that they were acting in accordance with what they were called to do as the council that would rule and serve their people. That they were acting lawfully because they got two witnesses. This was, this was in good order. We might imagine. But all of that falls apart when you see the hearts of the men exposed in the next verse. Because these aren't men who are simply acting lawfully in their capacity as leaders of their country. These are men who are simply out for vengeance. And the ugliness of it comes out in verse 67. They spit in his face and they struck him and some slapped him. They said, prophesy to us, you Christ, who is it that struck you? These men who no doubt have made commitments to their people to serve God, to honor God, to honor the scriptures, are slapping God and spitting upon him. 
and Jesus is committed to them still. (laughs) Jesus on the cross would say, of these, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. Of these very ones, This is our hope. Jesus keeps his commitment. And this is the way Jesus has been all along, right? Right? He was in the heavenly places with God. Very comfortable, thank you very much. But he didn't count that equality with God a thing to be grasped. He had this mission. And he was going to accomplish it. So he made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant. He was born in the likeness of humans. And being found in human form, he humbled himself even further by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. This is our Lord. He is God with us. And do you realize there's a suffering even in that? He is perfect, holy God. And he's committed to take on limits and to live amidst sinful people and to be tempted and never to give in. We've scratched that itch, all of us, every single one of us, tempted, and then, oh, finally we get the relief of giving in. But Jesus never gave in. He bore that weight for us to the end, despised and rejected, betrayed. And he did it all for us. Even from the very beginning of the story, in Genesis, God made all things, and he made them good, and he made human, humankind good in his own image. But then humanity, God's beloved, broke his love over their knee and say, forget you, God. And what does God do at that point? He doesn't press delete. <laughs> he doesn't end it all. He pursues, and he gave a promise, and the serpent This devilish serpent that had come in the story to deceive the man and the woman. He makes a promise to that serpent saying that the offspring of Eve, her offspring would crush your head. I will deal with you. I will deal with all that could possibly separate my people from me. I will not let anything separate them from me. This is the Lord's commitment. It's, it's kind of like uh, that movie that came out in the late 2000s, Taken. You may remember, he's uh, Brian Mills, Liam Neeson's character, is a retired CIA operative. And his daughter, who's growing up, she's a young adult, is going to Europe for a trip with friends. He's nervous about it, but he lets her go. But while there, he gets a phone call from her in a panic because she's made a series of bad choices with her friends that have wound up with them getting abducted by sex traffickers. And these men are taking them from their apartment. And while they're in the apartment taking the other girls, Liam Liam Neeson's character is on the phone with his daughter. And then that phone is left as his daughter is taken. But one of the abductors picks up the phone and puts it to his ear. And he hears these words from a man with a very controlled rage, a man who you would not want to be opposed by. And Brian Mills says to the abductor, I don't know what you want. If you're looking for ransom, I can tell you, I don't have money, but what I do have are a very particular set of skills. Skills I have acquired over a very long career. Skills that make me a nightmare for people like you. If you let my daughter go now, that'll be the end of it. If not, or if you will, I will not look for you. I will not pursue you. But if you don't, I will look for you. I will find you. And with his scariest Liam Neeson voice, and I will kill you. And that's the rest of the movie. And that's the story of the scriptures and God's commitment to take away all that would keep us from him. The devil has been warned, and the Lord comes to reclaim us. Death has been warned, and the Lord came to take it on himself. Nothing would separate us from him. He who would not spare his own son, how much more will he not give us all things, Paul says in Romans 8. And he goes on rightfully to conclude, there's nothing that will separate us from the love of God. He's relentless. You can't stop him. He's committed. 
even unto death, to make you his own because he loves you. Jesus is committed. But Peter, Peter caves. His commitment caves. Earlier that night, it was the night of the Last Supper, and after the meal together, Jesus had this bad news for his disciples. This night, all of you will fall away from me. But Peter, upon hearing those words, he's he's not gonna have it. He says in verse 33, though they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. And then in verse 35, he says, even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all the disciples said the same. Jesus had said, this night, Peter, you'll deny me three times. Peter says, no, I'll never deny you. He could never imagine. Remember, Peter loved Jesus. He couldn't imagine possibly betraying him. And And those of you who became officers today, elders and deacons in the Lord, those who have been, those who have made any kind of commitment to the Lord Jesus, I would just suggest to you, Peter is a person who shares your heart for Jesus. He loves him. He wants to follow him. He's a person whose character, I would would suggest to you, is probably not that much less than your own in terms of its quality before the Lord. An imperfect but earnest person who wants to follow Jesus. And yet, a situation that he could not have imagined until he was in it, when the moment came, he would cave. And Jesus would prove right. Verse 69, Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard, and a servant girl came up to him and said, you also were with Jesus the Galilean. Now remember, that night Jesus was betrayed and arrested by the servants and guards of the high priest. And they're in the high priest's courtyard. And so, if this is a servant of the high priest in the courtyard, this isn't just a friendly question. You know, she's not just casually asking for information. Were you the one that was with Jesus? No, she sees Peter as someone who deserves also to be arrested She's seeing Peter as someone who is aligned against the establishment of the high priest, which she is called to serve. And so this question puts pressure on Peter. How he answers this is very significant. If he says, yes, I'm the one who is with Jesus when he was betrayed, I'm with him. That also might identify him as the one who cut off the ear of the servant, remember? If he says this, he's in trouble. But we see what happens. He denied it. He denies it before them all, multiple people watching, and says, I do not know what you mean. But he intensifies his denial two more times. Out at the entrance, another servant girl saw him, and she said to the bystanders, this time not to Peter, but to those around, You see, this man was with Jesus of Nazareth. This is is that guy. He was one of them. And again, he denied it, but this time with an oath, he swears. I do not know the man. And after a little while, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, certainly you too are one of them, for your accent betrays you. Again, just reminding you of, of the credibility and relevance of the Bible. The Bible lives in the real world because it's a product of the real world and it's true. And there are differences in our dialects, right? We understand differences in culture just as they did in the first century. And you could tell the difference between the country bumpkin accent of Northern Galilee and the high royal accent of the Judean people in Jerusalem. Peter was clearly Galilean and and clearly one of those with Jesus. But then he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear as though if what he was saying were not true, Let him be cursed by God. I do not know the man, he said. And immediately what happened? The rooster crowed. Imagine the moment. He's just denied his Lord. He's just said he didn't even know the one who's loved him. The one he calls king and friend and master. And Lord. And Peter remembered the saying of Jesus, and he went out and wept bitterly. He's broken. What have I done? 
what, is, what do I do now? Who, who am I <laughs> if, if I'm not a disciple of Jesus? Well, earlier that night, we know that Jesus had given assurance to Peter, even in the wake of his denial. You see, in John, we get a little bit more of the picture of this moment when Jesus was with the disciples in the upper room, and Jesus has a a conversation with Peter among the disciples. And Peter said to him, as Jesus had spoken about going on to another place, Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus answered him, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow afterward. And Peter said to him, this is John 13, verse 37, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I'll lay down my life for you. It sounds like Peter. Jesus answered, will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow till you've denied me three times. And then look at the next word. Remember the chapter divisions are artificial, they were added later. What was Jesus' next word to all the disciples? Peter, the leader, (laughs) he's going to deny me three times. The next words, let not your hearts be troubled. Could you imagine anything more troubling (laughs) than what Jesus had just said? This was this was incredibly troubling. What are you talking about, Jesus? You just said that our leader is gonna fall away from you and deny you. Let not your hearts be troubled. Jesus says, believe in God, believe also in me, trust, trust me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? Now, when we hear this passage, oftentimes we'll hear this passage maybe at a funeral, and it's an appropriate place to hear that. But I think in our minds, we get a sort of Thomas Kincaid kind of airbrushed, precious moments, kitschy vision of heaven and mansions and angel wings and and harps. But I want you to think, instead of, of the mansion or the rooms for a moment, think of the going. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And what was that going He's going to the cross. He's going to be betrayed and mocked and abandoned. He's going to be beaten severely, terribly, to the point of death. And then the Romans will finish the job and nail him to the cross and put a spear in his side into his heart. And he will bleed out. All this in our place to secure us a place in his wounds a hiding place in his own heart that was emptied out for us. He went to prepare that for us. Why? Because his heart is to be with us. The hope of heaven isn't golden streets and a, and a mansion. The hope of heaven is being with God. Verse three, I go and prepare a place for you so that I will come again and will take you to myself and where I am you may be also. I'm going that where I am, you may be also. Jesus wants to be with you. Do you realize that? He desires you. You are, your, you are his heart's desire. He's come to reclaim you, to win you back to himself. And nothing could separate you from him in his love. Let not your hearts be troubled. He's gone to do this for you. Now Thomas was distressed because he's trying to think, how can we possibly follow you? How can we go to this place that you're preparing? How can we know the way? And Jesus, what does he say in verse six? I am the way and the truth and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. I am the way. Believe in God. Believe also in me, Jesus has said. Trust in me. I am your hope, come to me and I'll be with you and I will never forsake you. I will keep my commitment to you to bring you through to the end and bring you home to the Father. Jesus keeps his commitment to you. Now, if if you today made a commitment before the Lord, I hope you keep it. Commitments are good. We'll encourage you in that. We'll cheer you on. But 
not if, when you fail to live up to those vows, where will you run? It's not the end of the story. Jesus has prepared a place for you. He has suffered for you so that you could be safe with him forever, so that you could get up and like Peter, keep going and be restored. Now, many of our neighbors, when you hear Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, you may, that may dig at you today. That may not sit well with you today. Jesus did not say, I am a way and a truth and a life. I'm not an option among many on the menu. Jesus says, I am the way. There's no other way to the Father. There's no other path but him. And, and some of us may hear that today and experience that as, as arrogant. We feel Jesus is being arrogant. How could he possibly be the way among all of the gods of the world, among all of the philosophies and paths that could be laid before us? You know, we're, we're a culture that's a low-commitment culture, right? Not just a, a cobra Kai, get a yellow belt and quit kind of culture, but, you know, through and through a Burger King have it your way kind of culture. I don't get whatever options I want. And, and to the person who feels this most deeply, maybe that's you today, and that offends you about the Christian faith and a God talker with a Bible open. But just personally, I'll say to you, I don't believe in this lightly. I, I, I believe Jesus is the only way because he is the only one who has loved me like this. The only one who has love to give like this. The closest picture of this love was in, is in Christina. God gave me a, a wonderful wife who loves me and is faithful and committed, but even she is imperfect, right? But God, perfect, unflinchingly committed to my good and to yours, even when we've sinned against him, even when we forget about him, even when we break his love over our knee, even when in a moment of pressure, we act as though we don't even know him. He never wavers. He loves Peter, even through this moment of terrible failure and restores him. And even later, when he nearly divides a church in another region in Galatia, because he's siding with one ethnic culture over another ethnic culture, Jesus doesn't quit on him. And even to the end, as Peter seeks to follow Jesus and suffers on the cross, his own cross, Peter, Peter's never left alone. Jesus brings him home. He's prepared a place for him. Peter is his dear, precious lamb that he loves. Jesus is the only one. There's no God. Look at all the gods of the world and find one with anything like this love. You will not find it because it does not exist these are disinterested gods who want you to measure up, who want you to jump higher and be perfect and measure up to whatever the vision of religious perfection is in order for that God to love you. But Jesus is the one who, when you failed, utterly failed to love him, will love you still because he's committed to you and nothing will separate him from you. And this is the only hope And so today, I just invite you to look to Jesus. How do you get to the place where Jesus is going, as Thomas asked? Jesus says, believe in God. Believe also in me. Trust in me. Jesus is a foundation. You can go to him and trust him. Look to him. That may seem odd to you, but it's simply praying and trusting and saying something simple like, Lord Jesus, I see that I need you. I've forgotten you. I've broken your love over my knee. I need your forgiveness. I want to be with you forever. Receive me, Lord. And you know what? He'll receive you. You can't wander too far for him not to accept you. So whether you've made that commitment or whether you've never made it, or maybe you don't want to make it today, <laughs> I just hope you'd look to Jesus with me and I'd invite you to pray this prayer with me if you see Jesus that he matters because he keeps his commitment to us. Would you pray with me? Lord, we need you. 
thank you that you are so committed to us. Lord, for those of us now who want to receive you as Lord, want to know this assurance, the incredible comfort of knowing that you love us, even in spite of our sins, you love us and you're committed to us to the end. For those of us now, Lord, uh, we, we, we pray together to you, Lord. Father, forgive us. Thank you for sending Jesus to be our savior, to prepare a place for me. Lord Jesus, I receive you. I rest upon you. Help me to follow you. I love you. Amen.